children kids can we all settle down what we are going to discuss about today what is the topic we are going to discuss the moon landing the apollo mission nasa why apollo yes you can ask him rocket science we are going to discuss all of this and much much more but the time is very short you all have to make the maximum use of the very little time we have this evening it will be an interactive session but if there's going to be a lot of noise then another person sitting next to you may not be able to follow what's going on so i request you all to kindly pay attention to what is being told we will make sure that the session is very simple for everyone to understand you all know that there was one man who landed on the moon right who is the first to land on the moon yes and our guest today had the privilege to interact with neil armstrong he has spoken to neil armstrong he's met buzz buzz is the person to walk second on the moon yes buzz aldrin and not every day you get an opportunity to meet somebody with such rich experience Can you ever imagine somebody like him coming to Eden Park to see all of us, talk to all of us? Are you all excited about it? Yeah. I'm excited too, and he's on his way from Ashok's home in Deodar. So when he comes, maybe we can all give him a nice round of applause when he comes. I let you know when he comes. When you see him, you will know that it's him. All right? Are you all excited about this evening? It is a question and answer session. We are not going to be the only ones talking here. You can ask questions. Ashok uncle will facilitate the whole question and answer thing and it will be a very very interactive session. But I need everybody's cooperation to stay quiet and listen to what is being asked and what is being said. All right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. 
thank you, Dr. Roger Lanius, for coming and visiting us in Eden Park. It's a privilege to all of us. Ashok, please. Invite. We invite Monique here, Dr. Roger's wife. Big round of applause. Thank you for being here today with us. Please, Ashok, Dolly. Good evening, Eden Park. Good evening to all the viewers who are watching us live from all over the world. We have a live webcast for all the audience who are connected with Eden Park. These are people who have lived here and moved out. These are family and friends of people who are watching from here. They all requested a live webcast and it's, it's on now. A good evening to everybody. It's a very pleasant evening and I'm immensely proud uh, Honored, humbled to have Dr. Roger Onis with us today. Thank you, sir, for being here. And before we start this evening, um, it would be an interactive session with everybody here. Ashok will be uh, our very own spaceman. Ashok will facilitate the entire discussion this evening. Um, and. Uh, before we start, I have a question for everybody here. Do you know what is astrophilia? Is there anybody who knows what it is? Can you raise your hands? Love of love of the stars. Okay, almost there. Almost there. Study of stars. Okay. Uh, love of stars is very close uh, to what is the actual meaning of it. It is a rare love or obsession of planets, stars and space. And many children over here, including adults, have astrophilia. As for me, I love space, personal space, huge fan of that. I'm sure all my girlfriends here will agree that most women are huge fan of personal space. Uh, on the other hand, men, most men here, I'm sorry for if I'm stereotyping you, but you would believe that there are 300 billion stars in the universe. But when I say that the bench has wet paint, you will want to touch it to be sure. Yes or no? Yeah. So uh, we are all excited here, very, very excited because there are billions of places that we have never been to and we don't know what is there. So when it comes to understanding, knowing something about these billions of places, it always gets us excited and it gets us uh, very um, happy to talk to these people who know a lot more than what we do. Um, having said that, uh, I would like to introduce our guest today and the person who was instrumental in bringing the guest uh, today. Ashok Maharaj, our very own spaceman. How many of you have watched the moon through his telescope every time he set it up for us? All of you, right? Give him a big round of applause. About six years ago, when my family visited Ashok's house, uh, we were fascinated by the huge collection of books that he had. And uh, we were wondering if we could borrow one of those books. And so we asked him, Ashok, is this book yours? Can we borrow it? And he said, yes, it's mine. You can borrow it. And my husband picked it up off the shelf. And then my daughter looked at it and he said, Ma, this is uh, Ashok uncle's book. Yeah, he said that. No, this is Ashok uncle's book. Yes. And then when I looked closely into the title, it was authored, co-authored by Ashok Maharaj. 50 years of... Uh, title or show? Let me get the title. Uh, NASA in the World, 50 Years of International Collaboration in Space. That was Ashok's very own book and that is how we knew that there was a spaceman in the midst of the community and we exploited his knowledge since then. Dolly, uh, she's a 
Uh, she is a most helpful person you can see around in Eden Park. They have. Um, I'm just going to read out the name. Most people who live in Eden Park uh, still don't know about the little efforts that you do towards this community. Ashok and Dolly, after their doctoral studies and work in the United States, moved to India in 2011 and they evolved this NGO called Skill Studio to cater to the educational needs of the underprivileged kids, the first generation learners. Most of the kids that Dolly has tutored recently are in college today and that is indeed something very, very beautiful, Dolly. Many residents would love to join hands with you in your initiative and to help you to reach a further audience. Please let us know how we can. Um, before, um, I mean, Ashok works for TCS, everybody knows that. Uh, and Ashok and other managers, managers' motivational quote would usually be to say, shoot for the stars, I mean, shoot for the moon, and if you miss, you might land in the stars. Right? Kind of. Kind of. But Ashok is here to reason out and tell us, shoot for the stars and shoot for the moon and if you miss and land in the stars you will drift into the empty vacant space empty space abyss of space and you will probably uh, the lack of food oxygen and water will cause you to embrace the cold death right that's what ashok would reason out to us so that is the ashok that we know and about uh, dog Roger Longis. I'm sure most of you would have googled him so I'm not going to go into the details that you yourself can learn from Wikipedia. I, without wasting more time I'm just going to call upon Ashok and Dr. Roger on stage to have this interactive session going. Thank you very much, Deepa. This is a wonderful introduction. And I'm amazed to see so many people gathered here. And it's kind of equal to the karaoke night that we do here, right? So this is a very sort of an intellectual talk going to happen. And uh, I've known Roger for uh, more than five years when I was a graduate student at Georgia Tech. And uh, he's someone who is extremely graceful, right? Whenever we go for conferences, he will always spot me and then say, Ashok, come and join me, right? You know, it's kind of, you know, most of the time, people are very exclusive, right? You know, they want, don't want the others to be part of the eclectic community. But Roger was extremely graceful and then he will always invite and uh, he will have this chit chat with me when I was at Smithsonian Institution. And when I got to hear that he's someone who kind of talks to Neil Armstrong when he was alive and also to the Buzz Aldrin, who was the second man to land on the moon. You know, my respect for him went sky high, right? You know, how many of us really get a chance to speak to the first man and the second man who landed on the moon? So when uh, Monique uh, got a research project at IIT Madras, he tagged along and then he said, Ashok, I'm just coming just to kind of do a sightseeing. I completely ruined his vacation, eh? right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, first talk he started to give at IIT, second I organized one at ISRO yesterday, now in TCS. So there are a few other talks that we have planned for the next uh, one week. So he will not pardon me for taking away most of his uh, free time. Uh, so, but this is going to be a very interactive session and uh, this is going to be a fabulous time I believe. So over to you, Roger. Sure. Uh, we're going to show slides, right? Yes, yes. Okay. So, so the, I, yeah. Good. All right. Well, I was just going to say, I am Roger Lanius. Uh, I spent a number of years at NASA as the chief historian. Uh, that was after the moon landings, but we did indeed land on the moon. I want everybody to understand that. We did that. We did it 50 years ago, and it was really cool. Uh, we're going to do it again. I think next time as an international consortium, of nations, including, I hope, India, uh, that will be a part of this process as well. Uh, at, at the Air and Space Museum, I was also, uh, I worked there after at NASA, and it's a cool place because 
The Apollo 11 spacecraft is there. The lunar module is there. Uh, airplanes from all over the place, very historic vehicles are there. It was quite a unique and wonderful experience. And that's where I got to know actually quite well a number of the very famous astronauts. Uh, so, Ashok, wherever he went, uh, okay, there he is. Uh, uh, mentioned Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. I met them, engaged with them, uh, in some cases argued with them, uh, and in other cases I was happy to help, uh, help them just carry their luggage. Uh, they, uh, they are unique individuals and, uh, and no doubt are heroes literally around the world. So um, what I wanted to do tonight is just kind of walk you through the, the Apollo story ever so quickly, because uh, I know that we want to take some time and have some discussion. So um, are you all going to flip the slides for me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go to the first slide. So we decided to go to the moon in 1961. A long time ago, before most of you all were born, I was alive, but barely at that point. And John Kennedy, the American president, decided that we had to do this. And we had to do it because of a Cold War environment in between the Americans and the Russians and the allied nations on both sides of that Cold War. Uh, to demonstrate science and technology and, uh, and its importance for the future to uh, the entire world. So Kennedy, John Kennedy gave a speech in May of 1961 that set the course to go to the moon. And he, and he said it like this, I believe this, I'm trying to do the accent, I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. Okay, so that's the operative phrase. Do it by the end of the decade. Reach the moon by the end of the 1960s. And oh, by the way, here's my first Buzz story. So Buzz Aldrin explained to me that a favorite part of the speech for him was that returning him safely to Earth part. He thought that was the most important. So we embark on an Apollo program. Can I have the next slide? And we didn't do it because lots of people thought it was a great idea. Uh, this is a set of public opinion polls in the United States during the 1960s. And it runs up until the first part of the 21st century. And one of the things you will see is the blue uh, lines are people who are in favor of going to the moon and the red lines are people in favor of not going to the moon. And you'll find that through most of the 1960s, most people didn't want to. Mostly, they didn't want to spend the money. They thought it was too expensive. We still have that conversation today. Should we spend money on space when there's so many problems here on Earth? Let me tell you, we should spend twice as much as we are spending on, uh, on space because it helps us solve all these other problems here on Earth. Could I have the next slide? They also thought that the Americans and the Soviet Union were ahead or behind in space. And during the first part of the, of the 1960s, the Russians were ahead. That's all I wanted to say there. Go on. So we did go to the moon. We built a huge rocket to do it, what was called a Saturn V, 363 feet tall, the story, a 36-story building, basically, delivered 7.5 million pounds of thrust at launch, and here's an example of that launch. Let me tell you, if you go to a rocket launch, you are impressed because of the experience. You just, you, you see it light up, and then you don't hear anything for a moment, but then you start to hear the rumble, and it sort of hits you in the chest and make uh, feel it more than hear it. The Saturn V did that. Next slide, please. And we saw the Earth in a new way. This is from Apollo 17, the last mission that went to the moon in 1972. And you can see uh, the image here of the Earth covered with a, uh, a, a blanket of clouds overhead. 
And when you look back at it, every astronaut that I've ever talked to uh, will, will explain it this way. When you look down, all you see is this little object hanging in the blackness of space and the recognition that everything that you love, everything that you hate, everything that you've ever known exists on this particular body in the solar system and it is a place that is teeming with life. Life of all varieties, life of all cultures, life all around. And it's the only place we know where that life exists. How many of you think that there may be life beyond this planet? There's extraterrestrials. Okay, that's good, me too. How many of you think they're, here, they're visiting us here on Earth? A few of you. <laughs> Okay, that's fair enough. Um, I don't think they're visiting us, but I do think they're out there. And I think someday we will find them or they will find us. There's no question about that in my mind. I may not see it in my lifetimes. It may happen in centuries from now. But nonetheless, they are out there, and I do believe that. But when you look back on this planet from space, one of the things that you see is a real hopefulness of what is present on this particular planet and how we can do things to affect everything as we move forward. Can I have the next slide? And this is the moon. We've all seen it. We've looked up at it. We have gazed at it, pondered it, thought about it. What does it mean? Some of us have seen it through a Shook's telescope, I suspect. Uh, and it is different than Earth. There is nothing alive there. And that's too bad, but that's the way it is. It is gray and lifeless. It is important to us uh, because of symbology and other interactions that the gravitational pulls between the moon and Earth have. But unfortunately, when the astronauts went there, they did not find anything to... Uh, that, that we really wanted, and we didn't find any life. Could I have the next slide? So, in Apollo 17, Gene Cernan, who was the commander of that particular flight, flew this, this spacecraft down to the lunar surface. It's what was called the lunar module. It's a lander. Landing legs up, are, it's upside down here, by the way. It's, it's kind of flies whatever direction you want it to fly. These are the legs for landing, and down here is where the astronaut compartment is. There were two of them, and they had, and they left a they left an astronaut in the spacecraft in orbit above, and then he went down to land. Could I have the slide? And this is what it looked like as you're going in. As you look out of the um, uh, of the windows, these are the kinds of things that you see: just this gray, lifeless, hilly, and cratered and bouldered area. Next slide, please. When they get to the surface, the first thing that the astronauts want to, want to do always is to get out, to do the moonwalk, to, and, and Michael Jackson had not perfected his moonwalk yet, but, uh, but to do something on the lunar surface. But always they were told to go into uh, a period of rest and to take a nap. How would you feel about that if you were asked, you landed on the moon and they tell you to go to bed? <laughs> Probably not something most people would like, and they didn't either. Um, and on Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin uh, decided not to uh, go to sleep, that they were going to get out, and, uh, and, and within an hour or so they did and, get, and got down to the surface. So uh, anyway, the last few of the missions, when they landed, they had a little lunar rover, and that's what this thing is here. And they were able to drive it around. It enabled them to travel more than 20 miles out and back and away from where they were. They, they put up experiments, they did a little ceremonial stuff with a flag and some things of that nature, and then they were off and running. This particular mission, the, the 17 mission, they spent more than 22 hours on the surface, almost a full day did three different spacewalks and had a great time doing it. And I have the next slide. They had a little problem with their lunar rover. Uh, so one of the things that the moon has is this 
is very, very fine sand. It's almost, it's almost like a powder. And, uh, and it got into everything. And so when they drove on this sand, they kicked this stuff up. And they busted a fender off of this. So they had to figure out a way to keep this, uh, to keep the sand from blowing up on top of them. So they decided to do a little field uh, uh, modification and got a piece of cardboard and duct taped. Is that a, is that a term everybody knows here? Duct tape. Okay, good. Uh, duct tape, and they duct taped it to the top of the uh, of the wheel so that the sand wouldn't splash up on it. And by the way, there's an old saying at NASA, when the duct tape is gone, the mission is over. You can't continue on if you don't have duct tape, because you're going to use it repeatedly. <laughs> I have the next slide. So uh, on Apollo 17, they did a lot of, of rock sampling. Anybody here like to look for rocks and, and categorize them? There's a few people, okay. Oh, lots of people, okay. Uh, well, that's what they were doing, and they were they were uh, working in basically geology. They were trying to find the rocks, trying to bring back samples, and they found some stuff over here in, next to this big rock that was uh, uh, something they'd never seen before, sort of yellowish uh, rock-like substance, and it really excited them. Uh, they referred to it as the Genesis rock and something that would help us understand the origins of the solar system. And they brought some of it back, and it's been important as, uh, as they've analyzed this over time. Could I have the next slide? So this is Gene Cernan. He's in the, uh, he's in the lunar module. He's getting ready to come back to the Earth. Uh, he was the last man on the moon in December of 1972. He made a little speech before he got up onto the, uh, the vehicle and he broadcast it back to Earth. And he said, you know, here humanity is leaving the, leaving the moon for the last time for the foreseeable future, but I would like to see us return sometime not too far off. Well, Gene never saw that. He died two years ago. He will not see us return to the moon. But it may well happen in the next four to five years. Could I have the next slide? So here they are taking off. The, the lunar module had two pieces to it. One was this base area that they used as sort of a launching pad, and the other part is where the crew was, up top. And they're heading back to the, back to the spacecraft and to go back to Earth. Could you have another slide? And this is the kind of thing that they saw as they rounded orbit. Uh, the moon in the foreground, again, it's a, it's a striking feature. It's sort of gray and lifeless, and then there's this beautiful little blue and white marble hanging off in the distance and you realize that, that that's your home and a lot of people also realize at the time that this is the only one we got we're on a little ship ourselves and there's no lifeboats we better take care of it so could I have the next slide they came back they docked with the command module which is this piece right here uh, to return home I have next slide. They jettisoned this lunar module and it did not come home. It flew back onto the, and crashed onto the surface of the moon and that's where they are today. I, there's lots of stuff on the moon. And I have volunteered to NASA to be the first curator there to go up and put the ropes and stanchions around all of the stuff that humans have for all of you all when you go up there to be tourists and see it. And uh, who wouldn't want to go do that? I, you know, I, I totally would. Next slide, please. And then they come home on these parachutes, and they splash down into the ocean. And the astronauts sort of sit there bobbing in the ocean, waiting for, for the Navy to come rescue them at sea. There's some of the folks who hated that, especially the Air Force guys, being res rescued by the Navy. That's just wrong. <laughs> It's not an accident that the next human spaceflight vehicle that NASA built had wings and wheels and it would land on a runway. The, the Air Force guys really wanted that. Next slide, please. And here they are being rescued at sea. Again, the Navy aircraft carrier coming after them. Don't you just hate that if you're an, if you're an Air Force guy? Next slide. So, 
here's here's what we did, sort of. It was an expensive effort to go to the moon. It cost $25.4 billion in the 1960s. That's about $200 billion today. It's a lot of money. But it's not that much in the overall scheme of things. I, th I think of this as an investment in the future. And space flight is fundamentally about that. I think you could double that uh, or triple it, and it would still be money well spent. The first landing was on July 20th of 1969. Many of you know about this. That's the famous episode where Neil Armstrong sets foot on the moon and he says that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Everybody's heard this before. Apollo 12 landed just a few months later and Pete Conrad, who's one of my favorite astronauts and one of the weirdest ones that ever lived, um, <clears throat> said uh, his words were a lot different when he stepped out onto the surface. He said, yippee, I made it. And he said, that might have been a short step for Neil, but it was a long one for me, because Pete was only about 4 foot 11. But anyway, um, six altogether landings, three circumlunar flights. The technological advance was very significant. It changed our world. Just in the context of microelectronics, that's one example, but there's a lot more beyond that. The scientific return was astounding. We cannot underestimate how it has affected our lives as it uh, as we move forward in these 50 years since the moon landings. So, um, can I have the next? I think that may be the last one. Yeah. It is, okay. So that's my last slide. I know Ashok wants to come up and have some discussion, right? But, uh, but, but let me just say one thing in, in conclusion about this. There is efforts, to, okay. There are efforts to return to the moon. How many of you think you're going to see that happen in your lifetimes? I think all of you, or everybody should raise your hands there. I'm, I'm, I'm up for that. Um, there is major efforts in multiple nations to try to accomplish this task. And I would contend to you that virtually all of you are going to see it. Uh, it's going to happen within the next decade, I do believe. It'll probably be international, and it's going to be truly truly exciting. When I was a kid, I watched this stuff, I paid attention to it, and it jazzed me, and it, and it sort of made me excited to be a part of this as best I could. I think it'll do the same thing for this next generation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. You know, uh, we have a series of questions here. I'm going to do something very different. You know, though I have collected the questions, I would ask the person who has contributed to kind of come forward and ask it, you know, to Raju directly. I'd like to call Parvati Raju here. Parvati Raju. Oh, you're there. Uh, yeah. Can you pass it? Hello, Dr. Raju. Hi. Very happy to have you here. My pleasure. Yeah. So, first question is, are we alone in the universe? When will we have an answer for that? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew the answer. I do not believe we are alone in the universe. I think that with the, with the billions and billions of stars that exist and the planetary bodies that are out there, that there's got to be life on, it, on some of them. We haven't found it. They haven't found us. But I do believe it's definitely out there. You know, um, in 1995, we found the first planet around another star in another solar system. And, and it was a giant planet, sort of like Jupiter. So we, it doesn't have life like we know it, if there's any life there at all. But since 1995, we have, we have found, and this is scientists around the world working cooperatively, uh, we have found more than 4,000 planets in other solar systems, and, they're, and those are the ones that are relatively nearby because we can't see that far. Uh, and of those, some of them appear to be Earth-like planets. They have uh, a similar size, uh, an atmosphere, uh, and the potential for life to be there. I think we will find those, those beings at some point in the, in the future, who knows how soon. I wish it were sooner than later, but then again, 
you know, they're probably not going to be like E.T., if you saw that movie, or, uh, or, or some of the other sort of benevolent extraterrestrials. They may be more like that one from Alien. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Parvati, your second question is very important for our community. I will just ask this directly to Roger. Top three or five things that kid needs to do today to have a successful career in astronomical science. Okay, all right. Well, the first thing, obviously, is to learn math. Uh, whatever you're doing... Oh, that got a reaction. Uh, the number one determinant of being successful in a STEM career, science, technology, engineering, and math, and to become a professional in that field, is to learn uh, higher math, especially in high school. Uh, algebra, calculus, trigonometry, geometry, those are the key prerequisites. And success in those areas will lead you down that path. Uh, and to be diligent in your studies uh, is, is significant as well. So. Moving forward, that's that's the number one thing. And it may, and it certainly did when I was a kid, it may stamp you as a geek. Is that a term that's known here? Yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Don't worry about it. The future belongs to geeks, too. Uh, Diti, uh, your question on the, the doomed Apollo, do you want to ask? It's not my question, it's Kejimi question. I did uh, well, want to just maybe you can mention what happened to Apollo 13 day. Oh, sure. Came back. Sure. So Apollo 13, uh, it, you know, NASA undertook a series of missions to the moon. And Apollo 11 went well. They landed. They did what they were supposed to do. Apollo 12 did as well. They did so even more successfully than Apollo 11. It was a precision landing. They set the spacecraft down within, within about uh, 150 meters of a surveyor spacecraft that had been landed about three years before, and the astronauts walked over, took pieces of it off, and brought it home. The, uh, the third attempted landing mission, Apollo 13, had a failure in route. Anybody see the movie? Yeah, yeah some of you have. It's, it's now starting to get a little old. Uh, Mid-1990s, uh, where Jim Lovell was the commander of the mission, they had an accident outbound, and uh, the spacecraft was crippled, and, and those those astronauts could have died very easily. But everybody moved heaven and earth. Uh, the people on the ground, the mission, uh, the, uh, the folks associated with the mission, mission control people, the astronauts worked very hard, and they brought them home alive. It's a remarkable thing, and uh, to this day, it's one of the most astounding successes in NASA's history, as they could have lost a crew so incredibly easy, and they did not. Thanks, thanks, Roger. And Roger, can you be a little bit Come back. All right. Video coverage. Um, let me ask you one question which I always uh, thought I couldn't find a better answer. Why is the moon black and white? <laughs> well, the moon's not really black and white, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's sort of powdery gray um, because of that's the nature of the dirt that's there and the, and the regolith and the... Uh, and, and that sand I mentioned to you that's sort of powdery. Um, and, and so it doesn't really have much of, in the way of a color to it. Uh, but there's shades of gray all around it. And, and, and then there's also the problem of the way the sun hits it, uh, making it very stark in terms of contrast. Thank you. Uh, Wamshi, you had a question, yeah. Hi, Dr. Roger. Uh, to what extent did the Apollo program and the space race in general has led to a technological revolution uh, which has transformed um, and benefited humanity? And what about the future missions? Okay, well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, there's, I, I could point to all kinds of things in terms of stimulating, giving a kickstart, really, to uh, technological change at, that came out of the Apollo program, but I'll just talk about one for, for the moment here. Um, in 
The early 1960s, NASA contracted with MIT. Many of you have heard of MIT, a very famous university, technical university in the United States, to build a guidance computer to go to the moon. And there, uh, computers existed at the time, but they were really, really large, as big as a house, and they were not very effective, and they took a lot of care to make, make them operate. The, the task was to build a guidance computer that could push the capability of computing at the time and could also shrink it in size so that it could fit on a little tiny spacecraft. And so the, the people who had the contract to build this computer at MIT hired about a thousand of the, of the best engineers that they could find to work on this project. And those folks put their head down. They spent the next decade uh, undertaking this task and they built a computer that did its job. It was small. It weighed only a few uh, a few uh, kilos. It uh, it was able to compute to a level that was necessary to do the moon landing. Nothing like what you can do today. You have a lot more capability in your in your mobile phones than they had going to the moon. But it did what it was supposed to do. And at the end of the program, the workers who who built that, the thousand or so people, left and scattered after the contract had ended taking with them the knowledge they had gained in that program and all of the contact information of the people who worked with them. And they seeded the microelectronics industry literally around the world. Uh, they went to universities, they went to think tanks, they went to corporations, and they changed the nature of our, of our technical capabilities with, with computing, which, which really took off in the 1970s in large part because of this push, this kickstart from these efforts. Thanks, Roger. Um, in all of the Apollo missions, we never had not even a single woman uh, travel to moon. Um, can you explain the reason behind it? You know, we did have competent women pilots too, right? At right. this point in time. Yes. So uh, there were no women astronauts in the NASA program at the time. Uh, it was a different time uh, in the United States. There are people who were associated with the astronaut corps in the 1960s, like John Glenn, who said. We weren't ready for it at that point. There was too much of, a, uh, of uh, disparities in terms of perceptions of what women could do versus men. He also said we were wrong about that, but nonetheless, that's the way it went. Now, the Russians, they flew a, they flew a woman cosmonaut in 1963. Uh, so the Americans could have done it had they chosen to, but they did not. The first astronauts that were women became astronauts in 1978. And they flew, and some of them became fa famous. One of them, and she should be a name that most of you know, is Sally Ride. Thanks, Roger. This is one question from one of the kids here. How long did it take to build the rocket that took the Apollo 11 uh, astronauts? So the, uh, the, the, trip, the, the building of the technology took a decade, basically. It took 10 years or so. The uh, Americans had been working on a large rocket that was necessary to go to the moon really in the late 1950s, but it really took off. Lots of money got put into it beginning in 61. And by 1967, 68, they built a rocket that could, could accomplish the task. And nobody's ever built a successful rocket that big since. There has to be a new one built for uh, efforts to return to the moon, and it's underway right now. Thank you. Um, there was one, I don't know whether this is true or not, that Americans tend to overemphasize uh, technology a lot. And uh, there was one uh, incident where, you know, astronauts wanted to write in space and they kind of spent a million dollars uh, devising a pen so that they could write uh, in space. And the Soviets sent a pencil, right? Uh, so is that true? No. No. <laughs> no, it's not true. Uh, so uh, they always had a problem talking about trying to figure out how to do writing down and this, and this kid right here is going to ask a question next. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. He's got his hand up. We'll get to you in just a minute. The, um, the reality is every time you try to do something like that, there's residue that starts floating around. So if you use a pencil, the graphite on the pencil, anybody ever broke a pencil in school? That, yeah, right. And there's stuff on your paper, right? 
What happens when you're weightless? It doesn't stay on the paper, it starts floating around, gets in your eye or whatever. Uh, so that was a real problem, they couldn't use that. Some people thought, well maybe we could write with a grease pencil. Anybody ever written with a grease pencil? And that got problem in the same exact way. So this residue comes off of it, and when it's when there's no gravity, it starts floating around and doing bad things. So what happened was this was a problem. People were talking about it, and they happened to be talking to the the CEO of Fisher Pen Company. And the Fisher Pen Company's uh, CEO says, "I can fix that. All we need to do." is create a cartridge for the ink that is pressurized. Then it can write in space. It can also write underwater or any place else you want it to. And, uh, and NASA says, you guys do that and we'll buy them from you. And they did. Uh, they were a little more expensive than regular pens, but they were still only about $30 a piece. And uh, that's sort of a bargain. Right. Okay, so this, this, this young... Did, uh... So I might allow five kids to ask question, not more than that. Then, um, yeah. Okay. From here, it says if you see the sun, uh, people tell you become blind. But then, when you went to the moon and saw the sun, how do people not become blind? Well, uh, okay, that's a good question. So um, one of the things that the astronauts had was these shades that they pulled over their helmets. And there was multiple versions of this. There was a very, very dark one, almost a black one, that you couldn't hardly see through unless you were looking toward the sun. And, and so if you were facing toward the sun, you would pop it up, pop it down, and it would be fine. They also had one for a different texture. If it was a little bit lighter and wasn't quite as big a problem, it was sort of gold, and, uh, and it worked fine. That's why. Okay, we got a bunch of kids in line. Now, everybody wants to ask a question, and that's the rumbling going on there. We do not have too much time for everybody to ask questions. I will... Yeah. Roger, you can handpick uh, the crowd. This way. Let's, let's get a girl this time. Get a girl this time. Okay. And I don't care who. Do aliens live on the moon? No. <laughs> Why? There, there, there is Wait, nobody alive on the moon. We're pretty confident of that. We haven't found any. Don't come here. So, don't come here. so next, let's go to another question. So I'm just gonna have two kids here with me, and the rest will. Can you all go back and sit, settle down? You stay. You stay. Hey kids, uh, let's finish the program first and then uh, you can come and chat with Roger, right? Answer all the yeah, you can ask all the questions. Can you just go back to your seats, please? Yeah, go back to your seats, yeah. Go back to your seats. Uh, you know, he'll be available to chat with you once the talk is over. He's going to sit there and he will communicate with you all. Okay, go back. Go back to your seats. Yeah. Okay, um, one last question before we close this session. Uh, Gopa, you're here? Gopa? Gopa is not here. All right. Okay, uh, no, I don't want to read the question. Uh, okay, we'll have one last question from the audience. Maybe from any of the seniors here. Okay, Satya. Hi, Roger. Good evening. So my question is, okay, uh, when is the next uh, plan for the NASA to go to, the, to launch the people in the moon? Because it's almost 50 years now, right? So why NASA didn't try up? It's just a question uh, out of curiosity. The, uh, the, the current effort is to try to reach the moon by the end of 2024. So it's only four years from now. They may not make that. It'll probably slip some. But certainly, I think by the end of the decade, in terms of returning to the moon. Okay, Satya, answer. Okay. So, one question from um, Devaki. In what way can we get into NASA if we are really interested? Okay. 
Um, the first thing is go and get a, a advanced degrees in science or engineering. That's the, that's the core objective. We need really smart people who understand science and technology to undertake space exploration. And I cannot urge you enough to study hard and work at those particular activities. Okay, you want to ask one final question? Okay. Hey, kids, settle down. We are ending with the last question now. Yeah. Then we will be available to chat with you all. Right? I'm sorry to you. I'm a senior. I don't think you're a senior. Well, uh, Roger, I'm Dominic. And before the question, I wanted to say I served in the Navy. So I, oh, okay. You resent what I said. Yes, I do resent what you say that the Air Force uh, personnel were embarrassed that Navy had to rescue them. Please remember, what goes up must come down. Yeah. So we but have if to... the Air Force people wanted to come down on a runway. <laughs> yes. Okay. Next, we spoke about pencils. In the Navy, we still use pencils to write our logbooks right. because in case the ship gets flooded, the handwriting, the records are still legible. Right. So pencils are still used by us. Yes, indeed. Right. Uh, actually, before the question, a rhetorical question. You may not answer it. On Earth, you know, a dog looks at the moon and howls. Now, if a dog reaches the moon, do you think it will howl at the Earth? Why not? Okay. No, that's a rhetorical question. The actual question is, I read somewhere that you know, a small girl said that if you look at the sun, you go blind. If you stare at the moon, you become a poet. And is it the way to become a historian in NASA is to sit in your chair and stare into space? Okay, that's a great question. Of course it is. No, <laughs> not really. So, all right, kids. Uh, yeah, please can you sit down? Uh, we will have a private session with Roger once when this uh, talk is over. Please go back to your seats. Yeah, we will answer your questions, not a problem. Yeah, please go back to your seats. Uh, Deepo, over to you. Children, can everybody settle down? We have a last few minutes left and uh, it is an opportunity for all of us to thank Dr. Roger Lonius, don't you think? Yes? A bigger yes? Yes. And for that, now I call upon KGV on behalf of our association. We call uh, Mr. KGV to give away a small memento. It is made by one of our own residents. It's something personalized. Uh, KG, Athena has it with her. Athena, come over. Thank you all so much. And request the youngest member of our community, Athena, to hand over a small bouquet as a token of our love and appreciation for coming over all the way. Taking your time off to interact with children. Athena, you can give it to them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you all. It's very nice. All right. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to propose a formal word of thanks on behalf of uh, Eden Park to Dr. Lonia, uh, Lonius and uh, Monica for visiting us here and uh, sharing the experiences about uh, space exploration. And I think for the children here, I see many of them gather here. Uh, I just want to give one takeaway from this visit is they have focused on this mission and I, they have achieved great things. So I think all of you in your life, and you are going to be the future leaders of this country. So please focus on what you want to do in the future and you will be able to achieve it. Thank you.
and all the other residents, if you'd like to have a photo moment, we will allow you in batches so that we can all take group photographs with Dr. Roger. Request you all to use the stairs only.